Okay. Um, yesterday I showed you uh, how a downward continuation proceeds. Uh, we haven't discovered yet exactly how I did it, but um, uh, what you're uh, what you're looking at is the uh, the zero offset data from this model. Data is on the right, models on the left, and then. Uh, uh, going down, um, it's been downward continued as if the survey was at 26 meters, 50 meters, um, 76 meters, 100 meters, and then uh, 120. And then what I did is I took the, the top row off each one. So, um, and, and that top row, right, we still have a time scale on all of these. Uh, uh, left side of all of these plots uh, uh, that are the seismic data, right? So the the zero time, right? The imaging condition says, all right, at this depth, the downward continued data at zero time is the image, and so we took this top row here, okay, and that becomes the 50 meter depth row in the final image. So that row is right in there. Okay, and this 126 meter row at zero time at the top of this of this image is uh, the 126 meter one, which is right in here. And so we see we have, you know, recovered the geometry of this first uh, this upper reflector. We've recovered part of the geometry of the second reflector. You know, the steeply dipping part of the uh, sin form we don't have very well. The flat parts we have. Okay, uh, and then of course the multiple reflections, which are legion in here, right? First multiple, second multiples right on top of the second reflector, third multiples in there. Okay, those are uh, uh, looking like they're uh, overcorrected. Okay, and adding artifacts to the whole thing. First, here's the first multiple of the dipping layer. You can see it's, it's exactly twice the uh, the time depth. All right, so that's a uh, uh, that's a pictorial representation of what downward continuation and the imaging condition is doing. As the downward continuation sweeps through Z, all of the exploding reflectors land on T equals zero sooner or later. So, um, you know, let's just define our imaging condition for the exploding reflector model. Reflectors exist at T equals zero, at whatever depth. Okay, so we're going to define then that our reflectivity section, this is our model, this is what we want to want to get. Okay, we're going to derive it from our, our wave field P, okay. Um, but remember our original wave field P was for all time and at z equals zero. And instead the cross section, the reflectivity section, is the wave field P at t equals zero for all z. Okay, so we're just making that identification. Now, likewise, uh, we'll find out that we can do the reverse process. We can start with a reflectivity section, identify that as the t equals zero all z uh, wave field section, and then we can, uh, if you like, upward continue it and um, and derive the wave field at zero depth. For all times, okay, and so the inverse of diffraction, or or it, a, a, in actuality, it's it's uh, well, let's see, it's not exactly the inverse of the diffraction. Uh, it acts in the inverse way, but formally, it's a uh, it's like the tomographic approximation to uh, migration to the inverse migration. Um, uh, so it's actually the adjoint the uh, um, uh, let's see, what's the other term for the adjoint? Uh, the transpose. Um, it's the conjugate transpose of, uh, of migration, and we call that diffraction. Okay. Uh, the transformations between the data and the model spaces are uh, uh, in this, uh, you know, if we accept the, uh, the if we accept diffraction for what it is, and we call it the inverse of migration, then we have these uh, 
uh, completely linear and completely invertible um, uh, relations between them. So we can start with the data, which is recorded at the surface at z equals 0 for all time, uh, at least all positive times. And we can go from there to migration, uh, which is a model for all z at time t equals 0. And if we start with the model, we can diffract it into zero offset data uh, at, uh, uh, again, at the surface and all time. And then here is just you know, the notation showing you um, for the, uh, um, you know, we, we call this the wave field. And give, I'm giving you the arguments. You know, t means all t, all x, but at the slice at z equals 0. And here the reflectivity section. <clears throat> is really just the uh, the wave field p uh, at constant t equals zero that slice for all x and for all z. Okay. Later on, we'll see why these. Uh, you know, we can go around this cycle as many times as we like, and uh, uh, you might find out in in uh, seven fifty seven that this is an idempotent um, uh, uh, transformation. You know, of course, when you go when you model this uh, uh, using diffraction, you know, you start with a with a geologic model and you diffract it into zero offset data using the inverse migration. You don't get a full set of real data like you would. It doesn't have any elastic waves in it. Doesn't have any multiple reflections. Um, but whatever you're missing, you're only missing once. You know, so if you remigrate that. Uh, that diffracted synthetic, and then re-diffract it, you'll get exactly the same thing. So whatever you lose, you only lose it once. Okay. Item potent is uh, what Clairvaux calls that. Uh, okay. So so now um, I want to look at this uh, uh, at this downward continued data set in three dimensions. Okay. So on the on the top uh, of this volume, <clears throat> we have the original data at z equals 0, right? So here's the z-axis pointing down. And, um, and you can kind of see the model in there. You can see the, the migrated uh, uh, data. That, and there, you know, the, the multiple reflections are in there, too. <clears throat> um, but there's the bottom of the sin form. There's the dipping uh, uh, you know, anisotropic. And asymmetric base and bottom, you know, all those features are there. Um, and then uh, here's you can you, you can see the the hyperbolic diffractions from the edges of the of the basins. You can see the the bow tie right here. Time is pointing back and to the right. So this uh, upper surface of this volume is the data set that we would record. That could be a chirp data set. And as we downward continue it, okay. We're basically filling the volume for different values of z, okay, and then it turns out once we fill that volume, the front face is actually the uh, the migrated section. You know that's the that's the uh, t equals zero, right? The front face is at time t equals zero, and uh, so now tilting the the volume to look more closely at the front face. You can see, you know, there's the, uh, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple there, multiple there. You know, here's the uh, the main reflector, um, and you can see how the diffractions are collapsing towards, you know, from the top face to the front face. You know, the diffractions are collapsing into the edges, and we can locate the edges of the basin more accurately there. Uh, you can see how the bow tie. Partly, you can see. How the bow tie gets untied, right? Here's the here's the bow tie, right? And we're and it's it's connects all through the the volume. I, I should have made a uh, a view from the bottom, and it connects all right through. And here we can see that the the uh, uh, you know as we get uh, closer to zero time, that um, uh, that bottom of the sin form is uh, is taking its uh, its good form. Okay. And we're still missing, of course, the steeper dipping parts of the of the sin form. Um, so uh, 
now we're we're not actually going to have to. Uh, um, well, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, this is a migration method now. Um, you know, once we learn how to do the downward continuation the same way that this has been done, um, in a sense, <clears throat> um, you know, we can fill out the volume and then just identify the front face as what we want as the uh, the migrated model. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna develop. Uh, Cheaper and easier ways of going directly from the the data to the model. We won't have to actually fill out the volume, but filling out the volume, I thought, was pretty illustrative. Okay. So so we have a transform. You know, we fill out the volume. We go from the top face to the front face, and that's a wave field transform. Okay. Uh, it's it's one kind of you know. There's many many wave field transforms out there that that. Uh, we're going to learn about, and uh, this migration is one of them. You know, it combines the uh, downward continuation, um, which we know how to downward continue. You know, one exploding spot, so that that that's sufficient. Um, but uh, um, uh, you know, however we downward continue, we um, uh, we make that uh, that transformation, and then the imaging condition is. You know, just taking the slice at t equals zero. Okay, so it's a new transformation, and um, whenever we have a new transformation, you know, like like maybe uh, earlier in this class you were being introduced to the Fourier transform. So when you have a new transform, uh, there's some questions that that I suggest you ask, um, and to help you understand that transform and what it will do and what it won't do. Okay, so the first question that I suggest you ask about a new transform is what is its impulse response? You have a transform method, you have a transform code. If you feed that one spike, okay, what's what does it turn into? Okay, what's the response of that transform to an impulse? So if you uh, uh, if you feed and you you should have tried this when you uh, um, when you were working with the uh, FFT lab. If you feed a spike, you know, on the real, on the real uh, uh, um, time series, if you feed a spike into the Fourier transform, what do you get out? Okay, what do you what do you get? Sine wave. Sine wave. Yeah. So 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 the sine wave is the impulse response of the Fourier transform. Okay. So it's very much worthwhile asking what is the impulse response of migration, okay? And, and we can we can derive this just by uh, doing some you know some thought experiments here. What it, you know what's going on if our data, are, and we have two D chirp data right, and our two D chirp data have nothing at all in them except a uh, 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 a reflection pulse. At one time and one x, you know, there's all the other seismograms in here are zero, okay? And the seismogram right at this x one, it's zero everywhere except at this one time t one. There's a pulse, okay? How could you get that? What kind of Earth structure could could give that to you, okay? And and actually, it's it's this one here, and I had miswritten the uh, uh, the length of this. Uh, uh, of this uh, radius here, you you have to have this semicircular mirror, okay, and the center of the semicircle is right at the surface, okay. So that's one constraint on it, right? If if I'm outside the uh, the mirror, right, and I set off a source and I record at that same location, right, the waves will bounce off this mirror and scatter down here and down there and back over there, and we won't really see anything, okay. We'll get zero back. Uh, if I set off uh, a um, uh, an explosion, you know, right over here, not at the center of the semicircle, but somewhere else inside the the circle, you know, it'll scatter over here, and the waves will will get focused over in in the left side, uh, but we'll still get zero back, you know, here. All right. Just thinking about you know thinking about uh, you know uh, infinite frequency optical. 
right, uh, rays here, because we just want to describe the geometry. Okay, but if I'm if I'm sitting right at the center of this circle, and of course this is all constant velocity, right? No reason to complicate things. Then I'll set off the uh, um, I'll set off the explosion, and the wave will come out as as semicircles, you know, from the uh, uh, from the explosion, and the semicircle will all hit the mirror at the same time, and then they'll collapse, right? The semicircle will expand and then collapse, and I'll focus right back down onto x one at zero depth and nowhere else. So that's how you get a spike. I mean, pretty unrealistic, right? But but that's the only way to get a spike in 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 a two uh, D zero offset survey, okay? Um, you know, just one spike. So what this is is, you know, we feed the migration a an impulse, and its impulse response is this mirror. That's what gets imaged from that spike, okay? And here's the equation for it: the radius is t one times v, okay? And uh, oh, and remember, you know this this v is actually the half velocity, uh, and then the uh, the depth. Um, let's see. The, the here's an equation for the uh, the mirror. The depth of the mirror z is equal to the square root of the quantity. That's t squared times v squared. Okay, minus the quantity x minus x one uh, all squared. Okay, and you take the square root of that to get the depth. Um, so uh, you know we feed it a um, a, uh, uh, a spike data. So a, you know one spot in our data becomes a semicircle. All right. Uh, now for diffraction, we have a very similar um, a very similar thing. Okay, uh, and maybe this is easier to conceive of, and maybe easier to think of as being physical. Uh, you know we might be, we might be in a giant sand pit here. And, uh, and you know here on, here in our cross section it's just a giant sand pit, so it's basically constant velocity everywhere, and there's no reflectors except for one little one little ball bearing, okay, at one little spot, um, or maybe it's a you know maybe it's a cave full of uh, uh, a tunnel, um, you know we're looking at say kilometer scale here, and this spot is a 20 meter wide tunnel. Uh, with a platoon of North Korean soldiers marching across the DMZ at 200 meters depth, right? I mean, what were they planning? I mean, that 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 tunnel's there, <laughs> okay? Um, so so you do a, a a chirp survey over that, okay? You know, maybe uh, maybe this is all uh, you know clay lake bed at the bottom of um, um, uh, of uh, of Lake Tahoe, and there's one. You know there happens to be one glacial dropstone here that's you know five meter wide boulder, okay, and uh, and so that's the one spot. No other reflectors anywhere. You know there's no um, the water bottom is too soft and all that, okay. Or maybe it's a uh, you might even recognize this. Uh, let's say it's all lake water, and this is uh, you know Tahoe Tessie or or just a a big trout, right. And so you run your your uh, fish finder, which is just like a zero offset survey over that, and that that trout turns into a uh, turns into a diffraction. And really, this is the it's the same equation as here, right? But I'm solving for t instead of for uh, z. Okay, so this is the semicircle, and this is the uh, this is the hyperbola, which is we know now is just you know, it's cutting the diffraction in a different direction. You know, cutting that diffraction cone in a different direction, and so t is equal to one over v times the quantity uh, x minus x one squared plus z minus z one squared uh, square root of the sum. Okay, so we get that uh, uh, hyperbolic diffraction. Okay, so so you know, just from uh, simple geometry, we can derive what the impulse responses are. Um, now this comes with a, a particular warning. Okay, what if you do a migration? You know, you, you just throw your your you know uh, maybe um, maybe uh, Kyle Gray says, hey, uh, I got a bunch of seismic data and, and the contractors didn't didn't uh, um, uh, 
didn't migrate it. To, can you throw this into your migration and see what happens? Okay. And I want to see if, if, if it needs to be migrated. Do I need to ask the contractors to migrate it using their good methods? But you know, they could ask any one of you to, uh, um, Kyle could ask any one of you to do a quick uh, Stolt migration, okay? at least after, uh, uh, after, after another week or two. You know? um, <clears throat> so you throw it into a simple migration. And uh, there's this whopping semicircle that comes out. You know, okay, you can see some stratigraphy and all that, uh, but uh, and and maybe what you expected to see. But there's this giant semicircle in there. And you go to Kyle and say, hey, you know, the first thing you need to do is you need to get you need to uh, get those contractors to clean up the the stack because there's a big spike in there. Okay, and if it's real, then we got this bizarre structure here. But if that spike is just an artifact of something else the contractor did, then then you know we got to get rid of it before before we can do any sensible migration. So the the you know if you if you see uh, you do your transform and you see impulse responses, then you got to wonder oh uh, I guess my data is full of uh, uh, I guess my data is full of spikes. Okay, and. That may or may not agree with uh, you know your concept of what the data ought to look like. Okay, so if you transform some data and you see the impulse response shape, then you know you have you have delta functions. You've got spikes in the data, and that may not be good. So here's uh, uh, an example I assembled from from some of my old work and uh, and also from. Uh, some old work by uh, by some others on a deep crust. Uh, you know, here's a here's a stack, uh, and it's just the the part of the stack we can constrain from uh, the middle of the. Um, <clears throat> what is this? This is uh, the middle of the Mojave crust. Okay, you can see uh, there's there's uh, here's that that Conrad like thing down at not quite ten seconds two way travel time. And here's some upper crustal reflections. Okay, and and typically, you know, after all the processing we do, um, we just, you know, we get these uh, truncated reflections. Okay, and that's in the stack. But each, you know, each truncation here, that's going to act like a like a spike. Okay, and that means when we when we migrate the data, we get a mess. We get an upward smiling mess, okay, and so there's a bunch of semicircles in here that are uh, uh, you know coming from you know one from every uh, one from every uh, 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 one from every uh, uh, truncation, and it's leaving it's leaving our result uninterpretable, okay, <clears throat> and and um, until recently. These dish-shaped structures didn't make any sense to geologists. Okay, um, and so you know sometimes things take uh, thirty years to actually uh, uh, move the right way. So here's uh, some images from a paper by uh, Mike Warner, uh, who was looking at deep crustal surveys in offshore uh, Britain, um, and he could see this nice um, uh, Moho image. Okay, and this is what he want on the on the bottom is what he wanted to see, <clears throat> and um, uh, and it's cut by this ancient uh, thrust. Okay, which continues down into the mantle, so that's pretty spectacular. And he, you know, so we have a structural intersection here. He wanted to do the mig he wanted to do the migration to figure out, you know, what it looks like. What is the relative geometry? He wanted to get that right. Okay, the stack doesn't have it right. But but when he tried, you know, migration at a crustal velocity, and you know, this is after adjusting for the half velocity thing. Okay, so this is the right velocity. Okay, six kilometers per second is what that says. Okay, and you know, the whole intersection just is turning into this upward smiling um, feature, and that that just you know the dish shaped structure didn't make sense to him. Uh, I don't know, maybe now it would. Okay. Um, so he migrated it at too low a velocity, so it's under migrated. Okay, it did not form the dish structure. It uh, it kind of stayed where it was, and 
looked more like the stack, which he thought was more, more physical. Okay? But how bizarre that you would have to do that. Okay? So because of you know, how the stack works and how the data is prepared, all right, it has these truncations. It's got, it's got continuous reflections, it's got truncations, and all these different uh, time depths. Okay? And every one of these truncations blows up upon migration into this impulse response semicircular mirror, for which you can see the very bottom in this particular migration. Okay. So uh, uh, okay. So there's two possibilities. The dishes are real structure and the geologists are wrong, or some effect is truncating the reflections in X. Okay. Uh, in other words, we're not, you know, if if the reflector really truncates in the cross section, okay, there should be a diffraction at the end of it, and that would get migrated up into the point. But without that diffraction hanging down from the end of the reflector, right, the reflector gets over migrated apparently into this dish. Okay, um, so for thirty years we said, yeah, you know, it's all. Every time this happens, you know, whenever we see dish-shaped structures in the in in our in our reflection uh, sections, um, we uh, uh, you know we we've, we've just got uh, uh, we've just got you know the stacking process, the filtering, the the gains. You know that was truncating our reflectors in our data set, and so you know we we can't migrate them properly. You know we just get these ridiculous dish-shaped structures. Okay. Um, and, and the geologists were pretty insistent that yeah that's that's the case these dish shaped structures can't exist until okay just a few years ago all right in um, there started to come out results you know that that you know real real geologists and geophysicists who work for oil companies had been seeing in the North Sea for years and years okay they they started releasing their results and they showed you know in, in Really good, you know, 3D surveys. They showed that there are dish-shaped structures uh, within and below many basins in the North Sea, and they found some. Uh, I think Danny Brothers found some um, in um, uh, in the Gulf of California, and some of the uh, the seismic data they, they that that he and Graham got there. Um, uh, you know, we it's it's become a common observation. Okay. And it turns out that as um, as you inject a sill, especially into the bottom of a sedimentary basin, the way the stresses uh, trend at the at the crack tip, at the tip of the sill, is going to tend to turn it up. And so there really are dish-shaped sills. And uh, Annie Kell discovered this for her uh, master's thesis work. She discovered this in a three D data set that we had uh, from Hawthorne. So even locally, we have dish-shaped sills. And, and uh, at first, uh, 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 I, I, I got to tell you this, but I, I really I mean no, uh, uh, no disdain to my uh, geology colleagues. At first, the geologists laughed. They said, ah, there's, there's no volcanics in that basin. Come on. You know. uh, but what they, what they ignored was that um, you know the the volcanics were coming up through the foot wall and making these sills, uh, you know, kind of up near the range front uh, south of the town of Hawthorne, and just on the other side of the range, like ten kilometers away, is a is the giant flow from Aurora Crater, you know, less than a million years old. So you know we don't even have to appeal to like early tertiary sills, which is possible. Um, there's uh, uh, you know there could be uh, wow that's a good you're very clever. Um, I guess I might as well let it live. That's a little spider. Um, and uh, uh, so, so there's even more evidence. And then, and then there was a, you know, there's an earthquake sequence that started at Aurora Crater and and moved toward the fault, you know, and basically almost right under the uh, the the sills. So, you know, I mean, there's plenty of plenty of justification for for those sills being there. Uh, and Annie's got it written up in her master's thesis. So, you know, um, it turned out in more cases than we ever thought possible that the geologists were wrong. Um, and, 
and the dishes are real. Uh, you know this this example from uh, uh, from the deep crust, uh, a deep British crust. I don't know. I don't know if that's real or not. But now we now we got to consider maybe it is. Okay, that's possible. Okay, um, I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, this is uh, um, basically uh, now that we know geometrically what migration is supposed to do. Okay, um, before we even go and figure out how to do those weight field transformations, how to do downward continuation, and then how to cut off that front slice. Okay, um, you know we could we could slap a, uh, a a zero offset survey, like uh, one of these chirp surveys that, that uh, Gretchen was showing me this morning, we could slap that on the board. We could identify the um, the slope of a dipping reflector in the uh, in the chirp survey. Okay, we could get the slope, which which right. This is a you know those chirp surveys. They're they're uh, time sections, right? So the horizontal axis is x and the vertical axis is t, right? So a slope there, it's a slowness. It's a velocity, right? A slope is dt over dx, and that's uh, that's a ray parameter p. That's a that's a slowness. You know, you can express it in terms of seconds per meter, or uh, uh, seconds per kilometer, or whatever you like. Um, so we can take the location of that of that uh, dipping reflection in the time section, and we can ask. Where is that going to migrate to? Okay, what will be its final? It starts at x zero and t zero. It's going to end up at x m and t m. That's going to be the migrated position and the migrated time. Which remember, uh, you know, it does get transformed to depth. But then we uh, usually, when you've seen, uh, um, well, it used to be, you know, they'd show you the time section, the zero offset section, the stack. And then they'd show you the migrated stack, and both of them had time axes. Basically, what they did is they said, "All right, you know, we, we actually did calculate a depth when we when we converted it when we did the migration, but then we're gonna you know we're gonna divide the velocity back out of the depth to get it back into time. That way, we can make a direct comparison between the the time section and the migrated time section. Okay, so that was the convention for years. Now, uh, I don't know." Did you see any, many time sections when you were at, at Noble? Yeah, most of the stuff was in time, except for the things that they were, uh, were high priorities. They were trying to get in depth. And then they would do a depth to depth, too, and use low, yeah. low log data, too. You're right. To OK, so, so there's still lots of, lots of time sections around. Definitely. But when you, when you really have to focus in on an area and look at a difficult problem, yeah. that's when you start calculating the depth sections. The problem is you're giving it to some people who are like, oh, this is the depth. And you're like, well, not necessarily. Keep it in time until you're like, okay, no, we're pretty sure now. So now right, because you, you, you don't you don't want them to imagine that you've got the depth right yet. Exactly. Yeah, so that's that's the justification right. for for getting the migrated time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the uh, and, and you can go through this development if you want, but uh, uh, you know here's here's what um, um, here's what happens. Okay, so you get the slope that's p. You have the the original. Um, uh, and p is uh, you know positive and negative, right? Um, and and there's the velocity v, right? It's constant velocity still. And here's the uh, uh, here's the original time, and here's the migrated time. So what happens? Okay, if if it's a flat reflector, okay, p is zero, right? So then you just have t zero times the square root of one. Okay, no effect, right? The migrated time is the same as as the uh, as the zero time, uh, as as the unmigrated time, um, but the uh, as as uh, as the the dip um, increases, p becomes more non-zero, and so what happens here? It's one minus p squared v squared, right? So uh, uh, is uh, t m, is the migrated time going to be less than, equal to, or greater than the uh, um, the uh, uh, original time? What would you guess? Less than, 
Yeah, yeah. Got to be less than, right? No way to make, uh, well, you, you know, no way to make this more than one, right? Because you would have to subtract a negative number, but p squared is positive, v squared is positive. So, you know, it's got to be less than. OK. Uh, and how does it move, right? Um, <clears throat> it moves, uh, 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 you take your, uh, you take your, uh, your, your uh, uh, original position, OK, x0. And then you subtract t zero times p times v squared. Notice that here, you know, the sign of p does matter. So in this case, right, this p is negative. Okay, it's got a leftward dip, and uh, and the p is negative, right? As you as you go to a greater x, the uh, the the time lessens, right, for that particular one. Okay, um, so. Um, uh, it would be negative, so uh, you know you have uh, t t zero is always positive, right? V squared is always positive, so you'd be subtracting a negative number. You'd be adding to x zero, so x m is going to be greater than x zero. Okay, which means that uh, that it's going to move to the right. So it's going to move up and to the right. Which is kind of along the dip. It's it's the it's migrating up dip, and if you remember uh, when I was talking about the um, uh, the the CDP versus the uh, the midpoint, right? The depth point is up dip, so we want to be migrating up dip. Okay. <clears throat> now, what's going to happen to the apparent dip? That's the next page. Okay, and uh, you know, so we work through this uh, sort of uh, differential analysis. And we and we get the uh, uh, this is the migrated uh, slope, and here's the original slope. You know that we this is data we measure this right in the time section, right? Um, the the slope, the time, the uh, um, the position. That's all. You know, if we have a paper section, we could just measure it right there. Okay, those are those are data. All right. The thing that's derived in here that's most uncertain is the velocity, of course. Okay, and of course it's uncertain that it's constant, right? But uh, under that assumption, right, we have the simple equation, and so here the uh, uh, this number, right, is always going to be less than one. All right. Well, first of all, uh, if uh, if p is zero, right, then we take p and divide by uh, uh, um, the square root of one, right, and p is zero, so uh, p m is still zero. Right, so again, nothing happens to zero dip um, reflections, okay? But uh, uh, you know, so here, this uh, one minus p squared v squared is always less than one. So um, we take p and we divide it by something less than one. So um, the the migrated dip is always the migrated slope is always greater, okay? The migrated slope is always greater, so the events move up dip and steepen. Okay, so um, and I don't know why I, I put the data on the right and the model on the left, but um, if you look at the steepest possible um, structure in a stack in a time section, you know it's going to be uh, like a diffraction tail. Uh, it's going to be at a certain velocity. It won't be vertical. And so the uh, the steepest possible slope is non-vertical. It has to migrate. It's going to move up, dip, and steepen to become vertical in the model. Okay, in this in this sort of end member ideal case. So that uh, uh, that defines what what happens there. Okay, so let's go to um, seventeen. So you know people used to uh, used to sit down. With um, uh, uh, geophysicists used to sit down with paper sections and and their uh, their you know uh, uh, mechanical calculator adding machine type thing and they would they would run through these equations and they'd figure out um, you know where these these uh, um, these dipping reflections would migrate to and they would build a, a migrated section that way. Um, here we go. <clears throat> so I want 17 now, don't I? 
Okay. Um, And then later on, um, the uh, uh, you know they got tired of, of having to calculate every single point, and they actually built these. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the tools like Zipadips or uh, I mean it's kind of a fancy protractor that uh, allows you to uh, you know slap the, the the plastic down on on top of your paper section. And and just you know actually might you know rotate the uh, the uh, the things up um, you know with a uh, you know like a slide roll you know it's a combination protractor and slide roll basically that would calculate those equations um, and then uh, when I was a grad student it was a big deal some people had done their theses by by taking uh, you know they took a paper section and they picked. The uh, you know line segments on their on their reflection sections, and they wanted to see how each line segment would migrate. So from a line segment, you get a slope, you get you get a position, and uh, and so they would you know just run a simple DOS program that would that would migrate the line segments. And if you go and look at a lot of uh, especially uh, literature from the con the Consortium for Continental Reflection Profiling project out of uh, out of Cornell. Uh, probably a hundred million uh, NSF dollars devoted to that project over a period of twenty years. Um, a lot of their migrated sections are migrated line plots. Okay, so you know it was a way. You know when it was hard for us to uh, to to calculate and plot with the whole section because in academia we didn't have the Cray computers that uh, that they did in uh, uh, in industry. Um, you know, we took shortcuts like that using those so-called hand migration equations. All right. So, so uh, uh, we're going to we're going to develop the real way of uh, and the real quick way of getting the uh, the the migrated sections, uh, which uh, I think for Amy's um, Pyramid Lake chirp data set, you know, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of traces, it it does still become Kind of a, uh, a computational challenge, okay. Uh, but a zero offset migration of uh, a, a, yeah, a migration of zero offset data is not really a challenge anymore. Um, I haven't seen an uh, an iPhone app that yet that could, that can do a migration, but I could I could write one and it wouldn't be that slow. Um, and I suppose I should write it instead of just boasting about it, but. Uh, um, the uh, uh, but there's still some computational challenges for you know as as we as we get faster computers we also collect much bigger data sets uh, and then of course you know doing a 3D you know even a zero offset migration on uh, 3D data and especially the kind of 3D data sets we have now that's a real computational challenge okay. And we'll we'll get into uh, into some of those aspects, uh, but you know before before we complete the method here, uh, I do and Clairbot wants to give you a warning about when this isn't going to work. Okay, the migration that we just came up with with these simple geometric calculations, you know, based on the slopes and the positions in the uh, and constant velocity. Um, it's based on there. It's all based on this exploding reflector model, and uh, you know the key assumption is that the upgoing rays are the same along the same path as the downgoing rays, okay, from each uh, surface position. And here's some ways that 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 can break down, okay. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, on land, I'm always collecting offset data, you know, non-zero offset data. The zero offset data is crap. So the non, you know, the offset data is what I need to use. So you know, already, and it's really a topic for a different class. You know, we can't take our uh, fundamental, you know, our, our best data out of the out of the field. Uh, I'm not going to teach you how to migrate that. Okay, sorry, um, you got to take another class because um, it's you know it doesn't fit the exploding reflector model. The the path up is not at all the same as the path down. Um, okay, multipathing. Um, the uh, uh, um, 
it, let's say we have a low velocity lens in here, uh, you know, like a, a fractured coal seam or uh, or a tunnel or uh, um, uh, or a, a, a channel filled with uh, wet clay. Okay, then the path, you know, it kind of refracts through like a lens, and the path down is not the same as the uh, path up. Um, you can only get multipathing where you have velocity that varies not only in z in depth, but also in x. So multipathing really only comes with uh, with velocities that uh, um, that that can vary in x. And so, you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about velocities that uh, that can vary in x, but. Um, even when we solve the migration problem for those, then you know it's not it's not really a, it's not it's not a complete solution because um, if the uh, if the lens has too low a velocity, you get this multipathing. And so our our uh, you know this is a thick lens that develops a multipathing. We're only going to have solutions that work for thin lenses that don't induce multipathing. Or the multipathing is is insignificant. Okay, multiple reflections. Okay, actually, usually these multiple reflections happen near the surface. But just to illustrate, right? Instead of one reflection point, uh, I've got three. Okay, and uh, that obviously is a violation of our uh, of our uh, exploiting reflector model, and 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 it's going to make our our uh, uh, our t equals zero imaging condition not work. This is also this is another kind of multiple reflection. You know the corner cube reflector, right? Um, I, I've actually I've actually thought that I've seen this in a few places. Okay, so you know we can get it in data. We we get multiple reflections all the time in our data. Uh, much actually much more frequently than we get multipathing to this degree. Um, and uh, uh, so I've seen it, and uh, you know the migration is going to break down. The travel time's too large, you know, for the depth of either one of these reflectors. Okay, because there's two of them. So our imaging condition at t equals zero breaks down, and the downward continuation part could still work. Okay, and in fact, that's how we develop migration. You know, uh, what we call pre-stack migration. We we go right from the pre-stack data that have non-zero offsets. Okay, um, that's. Uh, uh, you know, our, we use the same downward continuation methods, okay, uh, that we apply to zero offset data. We just have to change the, the imaging condition to fit, and uh, so that's uh, that's a different topic. All right, um, let me take one minute and talk to you about what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, we're going to be in this. Uh, um, this uh, note 17, um, the number at the top of the page is 31, and um, we're going to be we're going to talk again about Fourier space. Okay, and the reason we're talking about Fourier space is the follow is as follows: um, it makes it easy for us to deal with our um, acoustic wave equation, which I'm showing you here in two dimensions. Okay. And and uh, you might want to take a look at this before tomorrow, just so you won't be um, surprised by my by my notation. Basically, p sub z z means d squared p d z squared. Okay, p sub x x in this notation means d squared at d squared p d x squared. Okay, and then here is uh, p sub t t, which is d squared p d t squared. All right. Here's our constant velocity. Uh, here's our, uh, uh, you know, this is a wave equation in, in the pressure field, right? Um, so uh, we'll we'll actually derive this later on, but uh, when I start into it tomorrow, uh, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, lose you guys uh, right away. So so take a look at that notation and make sure you you can recognize this as in my notation as a. As a two D acoustic wave equation, scalar acoustic wave equation, you know P is the pressure scalar field. Okay, thanks.